Welcome back to History 1301. Today we're going to continue our lecture on the expansion of the American colonies. So we're going to be focusing on the years 1700 to 1763. So a couple of points I want to uh, bring up before actually getting into the details of these four, you know, regions. By 1700, there's going to be these four very different regions that are developing. We have the New England colonies, the Middle colonies, the Chesapeake, and the Southern. Okay, so make sure that you know which of those colonies belong to which specific region. Um, for example, the Middle colonies are New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and um, Delaware. Um, the other sort of running theme here as well is that, you know, there is um, this perception that the American colonies, even though they're English, right, that they have developed a very distinct American identity. Um, yes, they're English, but, you know, the fact that there's no aristocracy over here, the fact that there is social mobility, the fact that there is so much opportunity, um, the idea that these colonists possess these natural rights as Englishmen is perhaps one of the only unifying features of colonial life in North America. And so as we're getting ready to you know, prepare for the American Revolution, we're going to be stopping short of discussing, you know, the effects of that belief of natural rights and the Enlightenment. Um, and, and instead, we're just going to focus on how these colonies develop, what kind of industry they have, what kind of economies, what their social life is like. Because one of the make it biggest misconceptions is that you know, once the American Revolution started, once all of these problems started to develop, that there was colonial unity. There wasn't. Um, these are very, very different colonies from each other. Um, they might as well be like, you know, 13 different countries at this point. Um, so once we get into the next unit, we'll talk about, you know, what finally brings them together. Um, but for this lecture, we're going to be focusing on how those colonies developed, their economy, their society, what life was like. Um, and it's just a continuation of what we've been discussing since the beginning of this unit. Okay, so make sure that uh, you complete your, um, uh, you know, review of this map. Make sure that you know where the colonies are. Um, of course, you know, way up here you see Maine, but it's not Maine. Maine doesn't uh, exist until, you know, later on in the 1800s as, uh, you know, Texas is ready to become a state and all of these things are happening. But at this moment in time, uh, Maine is actually Massachusetts, okay? So those of you that are doing your... Um, quiz on the colonies, you know, don't forget that. So you've got the New England region right here, you know, Massachusetts. This is Massachusetts as well. You got Connecticut, Rhode Island. Um, then you go into your middle colonies, right? So you've got New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware. You've got your Chesapeake cont uh, cont colonies, which are Virginia. Um, and Maryland, okay, because they're on the Chesapeake River. And your southern colonies are uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Okay, let's talk about the New England colonies. As far as their uh, economy is concerned, New England colonies have what is called um, diversified farming. Um, what this means is that you know, because of the climate, you know, because they actually have like all the seasons and stuff like that, uh, they can grow uh, different types of crops. So you've got, you know, orchards, uh, you know, your citrus, you've got wheat, all of these different crops are uh, being farmed in this region. And so a single home could actually farm the crops that are necessary to sustain the entire household for the whole year. 
Okay. Now, the other thing that we see in the New England colonies as well is the development of this commercial class of merchants. When you look at um, Salem, for example, right? Remember we talked about the, the Salem witchcraft trials. One of the problems that developed there was as more and more people started coming to that region, they weren't all, you know, Puritans. Um, they weren't all about that life, right? Some of them legit just came to make money. And so religion was not as important to them. Um, and this created friction, right? Uh, all kinds of different people are moving into this area as time moves on. Remember, Massachusetts, for example, you know, it, it was developed for religious reasons and, you know, the Puritans and the separatists and all of that. But as we're going into the 1700s, there's more development of the economy. There's, uh, you know, a rising merchant class that is developing here. We also have a triangular trade. And so if we look at, for example, what's coming out of um, this region, you see whale oil, lumbers, and furs, all of those uh, resources are being sent uh, back to Europe where they then manufacture them into goods and other luxuries and then send them back to those colonies um, and that's where that whole mercantilism system is developing, right? The purpose of the colonies was to, you know, grow these crops, to uh, harvest those natural, you know, uh, resources, and to send them back to Europe so that they would then manufacture them into finished goods and sell them back to the colonists because the colonists do not yet have the ability to manufacture those things for themselves, not on a grand scale. But again, that will happen in the next unit, okay? So what we're starting to see here is that triangular trade where literally things are uh, being sent from the New World colonies, right? Rice, silk, indigo, and tobacco from the Southern colonies, uh, sugar, molasses, and wood from the Caribbean. All of that goes back to Europe they then manufacture into goods and certain uh, other luxuries, send them back to the colonies, right? So they're, the, the colonists are not just, um, you know, growing things for themselves and, you know, landowners and all of that, but also customers, customers that are supposed to uh, help, um, you know, their country become more powerful in the long run. Um, we also see the connection here between guns, clothing, uh, iron, and beer being sent to Africa. And out of Africa, we have, of course, uh, the importation of slaves into uh, North America, but most of those slaves are going to actually end up going to South America and the Caribbean. Um, along with uh, that, you know, triangular trade relationship, you do have gold, ivory, spices, and hardwoods that are leaving Africa and then going directly back to the European countries. Okay, so that's how the triangular trade um system works. It is a pattern of trade where, you know, fish grains, all of this uh, resources are being exchanged between the three uh, regions. Okay. Anyway, so uh, when it comes to uh, society in New England, uh, it's very different. It's going to be very different than uh, the middle colonies and especially the southern colonies for the specific reason that people in the New England colonies lived in these small family centered towns. They are these small towns. Everybody's really close together. You know, you have these small uh, little farms, you have the town um, center, um, you know, everybody's really close to one another. They know each other. There's a lot of societal pressures there as well. But what we also see is a distinct class um, demarcation. So you do have, you know, your, your, your aristocrats at the top, then your natural aristocrats, you've got middlemen, the laboring class, and then of course there are slaves as well. Okay. Um, so yes, they are going to develop very, very differently than the middle colonies, which we're going to talk about in a minute. All right, so the middle colonies, remember this is New Jersey, New York, 
Pennsylvania and Delaware, um, they develop differently, again, because of the kind of society that they have, because of the kind of economy that they have. The economy in the middle colonies is mostly going to be, again, self-sustaining, um, in part because, you know, the farms in the middle colonies are going to be much larger than those in the New England colonies. Remember that in New England, people live, you know, in smaller plots of land, really close to one another around the center of town. Um, but in the New England, I'm sorry, in the middle colonies, um, People live in farms instead of in a village, okay? They are self-sustaining. Uh, their principal export here is wheat. Um, the middle colonies are known as the bread colonies because of that. And so think about that, right? When you think of uh, uh, Pennsylvania especially, right? Think of uh, the Quaker oats and stuff like that, right? Bread, they're the, they're the bread basket. They grow mostly wheat. They're heavily, heavily dependent on exporting that. But they also grow other fruit and they take care of livestock. And, you know, um, as far as... Uh, both the New England and the Middle Colonies, they both produce their own furniture, um, but not on the same scale as, you know, what Europe is doing. Um, and, uh, you know, the, these are some of the wealthiest colonists uh, in all of the 13 colonies. They live here in the Middle Colonies. So their society, you know, it's really booming. Um, by 1660, you know, there was about 5,000 people living in these colonies. By 1710, there's 70,000. By 1760, there's 425,000 people living there. So, you know, part of the reason for this explosion in population is, you know, better conditions, uh, better living conditions. Um, also, you know, a higher birth rate, uh, infant mortality rate is also, you know, going to be much lower. But immigration as well. So you got people from Scotland and Ireland, Germany and, and England um, coming to the middle colonies as well. When it comes to um, their society, uh, they, there is a, again, distinct class demarcation. You have your natural aristocrats, you got urban merchants, family farmers, tenant farmers, you do have poor, you do have slaves. Um, and remember also that the population is very diverse. Uh, the middle colonies, remember, they're the mosaic colonies, right? Because they have lots of different religions, lots of different ethnic groups, lots of different uh, religious beliefs, much more tolerant uh, than the other regions that we've discussed so far, okay? Um, what else can I tell you about the middle colonies? Well, when it comes to, you know, life, social life, uh, there are these sexual divisions of labor. So, of course, you know, the, the women tend to uh, the home and the children. Um, life in the middle colonies tended to be more stable than the rest. Um, you also have the rise of, you know, professional uh, uh, businessmen, uh, lawyers, craftsmen, millers. You know, you've got these urban institutions that are also being uh, founded, universities and stuff like that. And like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a very diverse group of colonists living there in terms of uh, their religious beliefs and practices, okay? So again, this goes back to the point we're starting to see a very distinct, you know, differences between the New England colonies and the middle colonies. Again, this is really pretty much the only thing that binds them together because as far as the colonists are concerned, they're like different <laughs> countries, right, depending on where they live. But they do share some commonalities. Um, let's talk about the Chesapeake count, uh, colonies. I want to say counties. The Chesapeake colonies. Uh, again, which are the Chesapeake? It's, it's uh, Virginia and it's Maryland because they're the two that are on the Chesapeake River. And believe it or not, uh, even though, you know, they're sort of a part of the southern colonies, uh, these 
two colonies specifically are going to be a little bit different than the southern ones we're going to discuss in a minute, okay? And the reason for this is because of their economy. Their chief product here is tobacco. Um, they do also grow flour, you know, uh, and, and, and grains to produce those flowers. But the big difference here that we see is that uh, there's virtually no development of the cities here. And again, this goes back to the fact that, you know, people live on plantations. Um, villages and cities are not going to develop as quickly um, as we see in New England or in the middle colonies even. So people are more isolated. Um, you know, those, those uh, what do you call them? Um, you know, major cities are pretty far away. I mean, Baltimore is the only sizable city uh, in the Chesapeake counties. Uh, colonies, excuse me, um, and uh, you know the society. Society is strictly hierarchy. Um, you know, families with land access are the ones that have control over religious and political institutions, and so you do see that there are, you know, a greater amount of slaves in the Chesapeake count, uh, colonies than in the other two that we've discussed. Um, much more extravagant lifestyles for those that can afford it. Um, when it comes to life on on the Chesapeake, you know, a majority of the people, like I said, they live on these farms and plantations. Horses is the main mode of transportation. It's not like in New England where you could literally like walk to your neighbors or walk to the town square. Um, People are much more isolated. People are much further away from each other. 50% um, of you know the land owning white families there own slaves, and so this is going to make for you know pretty interesting developments here. You see you know weaker social institutions like uh, churches. Um, you know the 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 sex ratios eventually they do even out over time again as more and more people um, move to this region um but it life on the chesapeake is very different than life in new england or the middle colonies and again it has to do with the way that they developed um the, how they're more isolated uh how you know their chief product here is tobacco how they have a higher dependency on slave labor um and so again chesapeake co uh, colonies develop much differently than the new england and the middle colonies which brings us to the southern colonies right what makes the southern colonies different than the chesapeake well, for one, we're talking here about North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, okay? Um, their economy here, they they don't just grow tobacco, right? I mean, the, the Chesapeake co colonies, you can see that that's like their major cash crop, right? But in the southern colonies, they're growing other crops, such as rice and indigo as well. Um, cotton is not really going to be profitable until after Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. Um, so again, that's something that happens later on, uh, a couple chapters down the road, but not yet. It's very labor intensive. It's, it's just not profitable to grow cotton yet. Um, and so again, you know, what makes the economy in the Southern colonies so, uh, profitable? Well, their emphasis here on um, their dependence on slave labor, okay? This plays a huge role in how these colonies develop over time. Um, you know, it's the key. It's the key to how, how they develop. And the southern colonies as well, they're very, very important to the triangular trade because, uh, you know, that tobacco, the rice, the indigo is very much in high demand in these European countries and they want it. So again, um, you know, it puts more pressure on them to rely on slaves after that transition to, you know, to slaves from indentured servants. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to mention about the southern colonies is that, you know, these colonies make much more money than the others, okay? And if you could afford it, you know, the southern colonies were a place uh, to generate revenue 
you know, they were a source of wealth, it wasn't really considered uh, like a place that you would want to live in. So if you could afford it, you know, you, that's where you made your money. That's where you had your plantation, but your children went to school in New England colonies or better yet, you know, back in Europe. Um, and so again, this is going to have a detrimental effect on how those colonies develop because as far as our society is concerned, because the southern colonies are considered a, a source of you know wealth and not an ideal place to live because of the weather, because of the uh, you know mosquitoes and the heat and all of that. Um, so the conditions there, the living conditions are pretty miserable, very, very slow. Uh, for those communities to grow. Um, again, this has to do with the fact that people live on these uh, huge plantations, much more isolated. Um, and because of, you know, their hierarchy here, you've got, you know, your plantation, plantation chiefs. Um, you do have a social hierarchy that's associated with life on the plantation. Uh, but you also see, you know, a bit of lawyers and merchants, skilled workers, and a huge um, amount of slaves as well. And so what this means is, you know, a lot of harsh punishment for those slaves. Those slave owners, they really ruled, you know, with those uh, draconian slave codes that made life pretty much, you know, very, very difficult for the slaves. Um, in the southern colonies. Um, if you remember as well, you know, part of the purpose for the slave codes was to control the slave population. And in the southern colonies where we see that they have, you know, the population could be, you know, 50% of the population, they needed to have these strict uh, laws in order to control that population, in order to exert uh, that kind of power um, and control over over that, you know, a growing slave population. So, um, anyways, uh, that pretty much does it for uh, how these colonies developed um, between the years of 1700 and 1760. Um, I want you to sort of pay attention to several things here. First of all, which colonies are in the southern colonies? Which colonies are in the Chesapeake? Which colonies are in the middle? And which of the colonies are considered as part of the New England colonies, okay? That's something that I'm gonna, I, I, I may ask you about on the test. Um, and those of you that are doing the uh, the quiz, the colonial map quiz, you know, you got to know your geography there as well. Uh, in addition to that, make sure that you know what sets apart, you know, these regions from each other based on their economy. What are they growing? What are they uh, um, dependent on? How is their society different? How are those communities developing? And again, this goes part of, you know, the bigger picture here. We started out you know, in 1607 with the development and establishment of Jamestown and then went on to uh, the New England region and, you know, we talked about Maryland and all of these things. Um, and slowly, slowly these colonies grew. Uh, they developed this very distinct American identity. They don't consider themselves American, but, you know, they're Englishmen. Uh, but life on in the colonies is different. I mean, just everything about it is different. The, the type of opportunity, uh, you know, the way that women are treated, um, the way that, you know, uh, some of these economies are more dependent on slavery. Um, and of course, the racism and the slave codes that are attached to that. Um, but like I said, as we get into the next unit, when we start talking about the Enlightenment and, uh, you know, the Seven Years' War, which is, you know, the French and Indian War, that's when we start to see uh, that colonial unity finally, finally starting to come uh, together. Um, and, you know, these colonists are going to start to argue for breaking away with a country that, in their minds, uh, doesn't provide them with any kind of benefit anymore. They sort of like outgrown uh, colonial life. They're ready for 
independence and freedom, ready to govern themselves truly. So anyways, I will be cutting it right here. Uh, make sure that you are you know, preparing for your test. Uh, make sure that you email me if you have any questions. Uh, make use of those study guides. And uh, I guess I'll see you guys on the next unit, okay? Uh, have a great day. Bye.